We are on. Awesome. All right. Let's kind of jump right into it. Um, I mean, I figured like, I mean, let's start with, you know, teenaged you. Like, what, what, where did you grow up, first of all? We're going right at the beginning here. The North Shore suburbs of Chicago. It was a, it was a leafy childhood. And uh, so it was like super suburb. Like, what, like, how did you keep busy? Like, what was, what was life like? At what point? I was very active in music and particularly, I was, uh, especially in the teenage years, I was part of Chicago's punk rock scene. That was kind of my, my community for the the most part and and what was adolescence like for you nothing striking really occurred um there wasn't a lot of you know acting out i had green hair and i played the bass at fireside bowl and i come back at midnight and have parents that were pretty supportive of that i think that the biggest childhood trauma was my mom liking punk rock which you know <laughs> That was the extent of it. So, the, I mean, the the whole getting thrown into the trouble teen industry, or, which is a misleading term anyway, was a strange contrast because the behaviors that were often kind of considered worthy of modification is not the behaviors that I was experiencing. Were you a troubled teen, <laughs> for back, lack of a better term? Well, what is a troubled teen? I mean, I wasn't drowning kittens. I mean, I, I lived among so-called troubled teens for 16 months and they didn't strike me as troubled. I mean, there were more troubling teenagers, you know, in public high school uh, and public junior high than what I experienced in residential treatment facilities. So so when, when did you first become aware as a teenager, when did you first become aware that like there, there were authority figures who, who viewed your behavior as problematic in some way? There was some sort of diagnosis of, you know, anxiety or low level depression. And I've been pretty upfront about that and and there was uh, an over medication for that but like how did that manifest itself like give me give me a sense of like like if i if i were to meet you at that age like what well you know that's an it's a great question i don't know for a while i thought maybe uh it it manifested through through bad grades and then i i went and i kind of retrieved my high school transcript pre sedu and the grades were great so i had to like throw that one off the list and then i I asked my parents, um, did I seem highly anxious? Did I seem like, you know, really suicidal or anything? And, and they, they didn't think so. I can't really identify myself I, as having these huge flags in need of uh, a, a major intervention. And then I've asked my parents this as well, just as recently as last month, and they didn't think I needed any intervention. So that throws into question, then why did all of this happen? I want to just get a better understanding of, of like how, how this even kicked off. There was a family called the Swibles. They are an infamous family. The Chicago Housing Authority's long tenured chairman was a guy called Charles Swibel. And his son, Howard, uh, was very influential in forming the Friends of Sea-Doo Foundation. And not only that, but the Swibles were my aunt and uncle's next door neighbor. Now my aunt and uncle, I'm, I don't speak with them anymore. They make Roger Ailes seem like Studs Terkel, but they were very tight with Howard and Cheryl Swibel. And it was a direct link to them, which made my parents get a, an audience with these staunch CD supporters. And they said, there is a place here where David should go. And it transformed the Swibel's life. And they were out proselytizing. When did you first hear about c -Doo? It was this kind of dual pitch. It came from a child um, psychologist who was out doing specifically c -Doo referrals. And this wasn't like a, um, a second opinion. It was a, like a queasy continuation of the first, wherein the the child psychologist said, oh, you need, you know, you need to talk to the Swibles. So it was this very small world out heavily, heavily promoting... Um, what sounded like to my parents is part therapy camp, part Outward Bound, part 1960s community theater. And it really called to boomer suburbanites. And then, you know, you have these these parents that are catastrophizing teen behavior. So it all got uh, wrapped up in this kind of poisonous web. So this this psychologist, was, was, this, was this a referral to to you or to your parents or it was to my parents i mean he it was the only referral there was nothing beyond that it was here's a vhs here's a a brochure and if you don't trust me talk to howard and cheryl swibel and then my parents did and and it was presented to me as this uh as a, a reprieve from public high school i didn't know it was really the two-year term no one had mentioned that to me and it looked appealing frankly so okay so your parents i just want to get the timeline right your parents they visit this child psychologist. I, I'm still not. I'm still not clear on why. I did. I did overdose once, which caused my parents to go into a, a massive panic. And I talk about that in the 2018 article 
Um, and I think I, I even spoke about that in the podcast. I never considered it a suicide attempt. I didn't have my stomach pumped. It wasn't a cry for help. Or if it was, it was a, a really shitty one. <laughs> um, I, I remember hating the meds I was taking. Absolutely hated them. And I felt just uh, poisoned and side effects. Just absolutely med-headed all the time. And I can see that in photos. You know, like, uh, this is not someone in, in need of this medication. And I remember just really desperately trying to get off it and feeling just overly medicated all the time, just med drenched. Do you remember any conversations with your parents about, did they ever sit you down and were like, hey, we think, you know, the, the, the psychologist says that you need, you know, these medications, we think this will be helpful. You don't remember any of those conversations? No, I don't remember any of that. And I think if my parents were here, they wouldn't remember that either. None. They weren't, that wasn't the type of uh, family. I mean, it was loving and compassionate, uh, and also relatively indifferent. There wasn't a lot of parenting. Yeah. Did, I mean, have you talked about it with them since then? Like, did, did, do they have any memories? I mean, I've been investigating my childhood for six years now. I mean, it's very complicated to retrieve any, any clear, <laughs> you know, there's no fact checking process here. Uh, and then I, I'll go to, I'll go to like, you know, try and confirm something they said with another adult and they, they don't even remember who I am. So, I mean, it's not exactly easy. Okay. So they're, you know, concerned, sounds like mostly about this low level OD thing. They talk to the child psychologist, child psychologist, you know, suggests c -do. It's the only suggestion he has. That's it. There's nothing else. There's no, well, maybe you should. <laughs> Maybe he should take daily walks. Maybe he should do some breathing exercises. Maybe he should get off these medications. It was a very forceful, very loud, the only intervention necessary is this program. And this program, by the way, is the best place to treat depression in the entire country. And that, that much is very clear, that particular part of the pitch. And then, so then your parents invite their neighbors over. Well, it's not their neighbors. No, it's not their neighbors. I mean, there's a whole world of difference between my, where my family was at and where the Swibles. I mean, the Swibles' next door neighbor was also Michael Jordan. I mean, they were in a rarefied, dinner jacketed world. They were in a different part of town. And that is actually the key part to their pitch is that my parents were aware of the Swibel name. My father was enamored with Howard Swibel. He's a prince. This power imbalance was very effective to, to recruiting. And my dad has acknowledged that as well. And and so, like, how, how did it work logistically? Did they just, like, showed up at the house and sat in your couch, or...? I have a different memory of this. I remember actually being either at their house or my aunt and uncle's house, but my father remembers Howard Swibel himself coming to our home in winter of 99, specifically to talk to my parents about their ambivalence about sea -Doo. Uh, so they must have had a phone conversation prior. What my parents have told me is that they weren't prepared to make a giant leap, that was his phrase, my, my dad's phrase, to see you because it didn't seem necessary. My at-risk-isms were not, you know, apart from the overdose, were not significant. So the point of the Howard conversation was to sell them on this. And my, you know, my dad said that, uh, and this is my father's quote, that Howard was prepared for every argument and every counter-argument about enrolling someone at see you uh, it was such, my dad has said that it was such a strong point of view that he still remembers it. And were you a part of these conversations at all, or is this, this is purely between your parents and the Zweibels? I, I remember the Zweibels speaking to me directly. I don't remember what they said. I remember just a, a feeling of, they were the thing that you're supposed to rebel against. <laughs> right. So you didn't like the Zweibels right off the bat. I didn't like my aunt and uncle. You know, I absolutely, I, but they were all part of the same world that I just... You know, there was this whole movement to, ostensibly it was to reform adolescence, but really there seemed to be this kind of um, fundamental belief that I mean, they were do-gooders. they were do -gooders. And, you know, as, as a punk kid, you're, you're against do-gooding. You know, that, that's just a, a false narrative right there. But I, I think what I remember uh, the most from them that stuck is an unbudgeable fanaticism. Like th that was so clear that their Friends of Sea-Doo Foundation, which was all just parents of um, Sea-Doo graduates, on paper they were what they were trying to do was help with the preposterously high tuition. You know, they it was a a, fi a financial thing. But what they really, what they, I mean, my dad remembers going to to meetings in like I don't know, church basements or something with the Swibles, particularly Cheryl Swibel really talking about this education that they were receiving from CDU too. So it really, it seemed very cultic and very self-helpy and not 
whatsoever dealing with kids, even though this is a really a children's uh, charity. It just lacked children. So do, do you remember, you know, when the decision was actually made to send you? Uh, I don't specifically, but I, I would imagine it was after Howard Swivel came to the house and did, did what my dad called a hard sale. I mean, that, that was his word, hard sell for it, and a very unhurried one. So I would imagine that was it. That convinced him because they, they uh, I mean, look, this is a guy that was in promos talking about how this is the most intense and successful program of its kind. And you have that coupled with uh, a, a child psychologist saying it's the only place for depression treatment. So you have these really loud voices that are drowning out facts. Do, um, do you remember... Like when, when the decision was made, like, do you remember how that was presented to you by your parents? Yeah. I mean, I think they said that I would be, um, trying this, um, this private high school in California, just trying it out, you know, for, for a couple of weeks and see what it's like. I do remember that my mom took a camp. She flew out by herself and she took a tour of the, uh, of the compound. And she remembers that quite vividly because there were no adults. The tour guide was, um, a, a current resident at the time who just so happened to have been sent to see you by the same psychologist. She was from a neighboring town and my mom could see this kid healthy, glowing, you know, and, and really she could, she could then picture her own kid there. Um, and it was a very deliberate and very smart marketing move for prospective parents is to not deal at all with adults. You deal with kids and you deal with kids that represent your own. How did they pitch it to you? You were into it or like? I was totally into it. I saw it as um, a little vacation that was really necessary. I also secretly thought it'd be a place where I could get off the meds because, you know, medication management is one of the things that they offered. And instead they just, I mean, they, that's not what happened at all. I mean, they loaded me up on more of it and they didn't manage it whatsoever. So what did you, what did you pack? Well, I, I packed too much. I mean, anything I brought was probably left behind and then you purchase everything at the commissary and that was a tech you know, tactic too. The expectation is that you're going to bring all the things associated with your image. And the whole point is to um, remove you of all identity and all image. How did you feel about that as like a punk rock guy suddenly having to throw out all your black shit? I wasn't just throwing it out. It's watching my father like take the entire suitcase back with him. <laughs> you know, that was the least of my, of the problems. Uh, it, immediately stepping foot to see you. It was abundantly clear that this was not what had been advertised to me. It wasn't like I, you know, I went with my father. My dad didn't get a tour. He, he was, he was escorted out really. Yeah. So back up for a sec. Like, so you, you fly out to California with your dad and then where, where, where is it actually located? Uh, the Sea-Doo California facility at the time, it was in the San Bernardino mountains in a little town called Running Springs. It's about 6,000 feet above sea level. What were your first impressions? Like when you showed up with your dad? Uh, it seemed ominous. It did not look like a ski lodge or a, a, a historic mansion once owned by Hollywood royalty. It looked decrepit. It looked, you know, this was a, this was a horror movie. Um, I, I got a very bad feeling. So it, it sounds like you, I mean, you just did a complete 180, like right, right out of the gate. Like in terms of like you had hopes that it would be this like, you know, nice private thing. And, and immediately it sounds like even, even before you started interacting with people the, you know, that, that fantasy dissipated very quickly. Very quickly. I mean, the former president of the International Cultic Studies Association um, referred to CDU as, you know, a place where amateurs operated an unregulated prison camp. It had a very strong prison, <laughs> prison camp sort of vibe <laughs> immediately. Yeah. And did you turn to your dad and, and say that to him or... I was basically, I landed with a thump in front of it and then they, they shoot him away. It was a day trip for him. You know, we flew from O'Hare to uh, Ontario, rented a car, drove up the mountain and that was it. You know, and then he drove back down the mountain, went back to Ontario and flew back to O'Hare. Were, were they friendly about it? Absolutely not. It was very much like, you know, the moving process was, you know, they take a mug shot, really. It's a Polaroid. You hand over your civilian clothes. They make you sign a student procedures, rules, policy, guidelines, and rights form where they kind of talk about their policies. And then after you sign it, they just flagrantly ignore all of their policies that are listed there. Uh, you know, that was something that was disturbing for me um, as I'm signing something that um, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and then there's this, you know, the agreement form where you're agreeing to give up 
I'll be specific here because I, you know, I, I have the, these documents now. So, the, the, you know, uh, the child is agreeing to give up magazines, books, credit cards, money, purses, wallets, cameras, radios, and in return, CDU promises that it will provide a safe, healthful, and comfortable new home that is free from corporate punishment and unusual punishment and infliction of pain and humiliation and intimidation and ridicule and coercion and threat, mental abuse. Um, it just lists all the things that, you know, this, this pact gives you. And that was very daunting <laughs> to read, um, especially because then you sign it and then they just put it in a drawer and you never see it again. You're already in a cramped, dingy office, but then you go into like a closet with a, a, a counselor and then you have a a, a cavity search and that that's really jarring because it, it really was sort of like going into a private prison at that point what, what was the attitude of the people that you that processed you like were they were they trying to put on like a, a friendly smile oh there were no friendly smiles there this is all tough love no there was it was a, it was a lot of arrogance it was a lot of um smirking my cavity search happened by a, a counselor who i immediately sensed was a sleazebag and and there are allegations of horrible behavior, far worse than, you know, invasive, humiliating searches. And actually just um, not long ago, he was placed on leave uh, from um, a religious uh, high school for uh, accusations of inappropriate contact. So it's kind of followed him for decades, this particular individual. So that's something else I had to experience as well, was just this a, a real it was the only time in my life that it ever happened too so how, how did that how did that condescension sort of manifest itself like what did people say to you do you remember any of those conversations i don't remember specific conversations i just remember looks i mean this all happened very quickly the moving process did not take hours and then within that time you're giving up your clothes you're signing away your rights you're having you know cavity searches um and you're seeing your family depart okay so you get you get processed and then then what happens i did go to, i did have to go to the commissary and get new clothes i had to i was introduced to what they called my older brother who was um a resident further along and um and they usually kind of sit you down and tell you the rules and and how weird the place is going to be but you'll you know how tough it's going to be a lot of what happened after the moving process was learning language because cdu had its own lingo it was a secret lingo. So a lot of the relationships that develop early on is just an introduction into this new way of life and this new language you have to learn. What, what were the other residents like? Everyone seemed really normal, the kids. There were a lot of locals. There was even one guy who um, <laughs> knew my punk band. You know, like it, it, it seemed like the West campus of my public high school just with like really bad clothing. The med line was very long. Everyone looked very puffy. Um, a lot of bloodshot eyes, a lot of crying and a lot of touching. That was the thing that really threw me. I recall towards the evening and that, that's what kind of put me into a major panic and I had to leave is, is watching what they called smushing. That was a, a very disturbing visual. What is smushing? Smushing is a, a forced cuddling that would uh, occur between residents and other residents and residents and staff um and it was required it was nightly it was uh you know they would have the smush piles so they were it was like clothed orgies so you so you witnessed the smushing the first night i mean i i my move in i think was um like late afternoon so it really was you know then dinner time then smush time like smush time it's like i mean did, did someone introduce you it's like Hey, now we're going to do smush time. This is, this is what it's about. Yeah. I mean, I think there was, it was also part of the education of the language of the rules, you know, everything, every minute of your life was, was, um, guided by their schedule. So it was just, I was just memorizing what I had to do minute by minute. And towards the end of the evening, it was always, you know, people would just gather up and smush. That's the, the sort of the lasting, um, legacy of c -Doo in terms of this industry is, I mean, even people that are still very pro TTI and working in it and loyalists will, you know, in quieter moments kind of say, yeah, the smushing thing may have been a little too much. But it like, was, was the smushing like ever like explained like what the purpose was? Touch is loving, touch is healing, you know, that, that it's a, it's a, you have to understand that, um, one of the fundamental rules of CDU is that, you know, there's no sex, there's no kissing, there's no touching that's considered inappropriate. Um, you were not allowed to have relationships. 
uh, if you had feelings for another resident, you had to cop to it, and then you would be banned from them. You weren't allowed to speak with them. So they were. it was a very contradictory set of rules. You have kids, aren't allowed to have these feelings, but you're you know, very clearly... <laughs> rubbing up against each other nightly and and obviously and some of the some of the staff were having relationships with with those residents but within the you know the resident population you were not whatsoever allowed to um, have any lascivious thoughts at all and if you did that was outed um, so it was a lot to endure the overwhelmingness um, is is really impossible to distill and 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 honestly, once I was installed there, I I was just nothing more than a startled contactee. I mean, like I I just needed to leave. Right. So you so you witness this thing. You're in, you're just like fuck this. I'm out of here. And and so where where did you go next? Who who did you talk to? I mean, it was a it was a very complicated evening because I I demanded a phone call and they refused and I I got very uh, upset. Unfortunately for me, the counselor who had overseen my cavity search was now you know running the show that night. He was the all-powerful counselor making the decisions for the evening. Um, I just wanted to call my parents because I knew they had been conned. And it wasn't a winter camp for young depressives. It was, you know, an all-purpose detention center. And I thought I could freely call out of the facility. No one had told me at that point, you're not allowed to make any phone calls. What happened was I went to the um, to that same counselor. I demanded a phone call. Uh, he refused. The cavity search counselor? Yes. From my recollection, I got louder and more forceful as well, saying I'm, I'm allowed a phone call. My dad's still nearby. If I can't call him, let me call my mother. And that was, you know, I wasn't allowed to do that. And I think at one point I, I looked at a pair of scissors and I said, if you do not let me make a phone call, I'm going to like cut my arm or something like that. I didn't actually grab the scissors off the table. I just pointed to them. And that was enough to get me 5150'd. What does that mean? Uh, psychiatric hold, 72 hour. I don't recall how this happened, but I was then transported down the mountain to what's called Ward B. And it was, you know, like the San Bernardino County psych facility a, a kind of facility that i think would have been more appropriate for like 18th century london i mean it was not a good place but they had pay phones and i immediately called my mom what did you say get me the fuck out of here i remember my mom being angry that i wasn't doing the program and that she had gotten calls from the facility that i'm already like too defiant she, she was just angry and you you, know, you have to go back so I did. I mean, I think I spent the night there and then I just returned the next day. It wasn't a full 72 hour hold. That was very common, by the way, getting 5150. It was, and then safe house. That was another thing they did too, is they would safe house, like take kids off campus and the state knew about it and were horrified. Yeah, I mean, the state was aware of these things, yet not revoking or suspending the license. They would just hit them for uh, you know, with a little fine and they would just substantiate the, uh, the allegation. I mean, that must have been, I mean, when you had that conversation with your mom, I mean, that must have been heartbreaking. That was one of many, many heartbreaking phone calls with my parents. Um, the majority of those phone calls were not done in psych facilities with a payphone. It was, you know, with this um, mountain ogress uh, family liaison who was monitoring the call. And if I would blurt out anything remotely true, she would hang the you know, hang up on me. And then I would lose my phone call privilege for that two week period. And then she would call back my parents immediately and say, you know, he's getting worse. He needs the program kind of thing. My mom told me that she'd wait for a phone call and cringe. I mean, it was, they, they weren't happy with these phone calls either, mainly because at their end, Sidhu did not look kindly on parents. You know, the, the staffers there, including the uh, family liaison to, to my parents, they, they made them feel like oblivious and out of their depth. And they, you know, my parents were very aware that they were trying to keep the family disassembled and they would beat themselves off after f phone calls. You know, my parents would, they would just feel like everything was their, their error. Uh, and they would just never suspect that these updates were like just wrong or entirely false. So can you give me an example? I mean, not off the top of my head, it, there was just a, a very clear narratives that, that staffers were trying to pull from kids for the reasons for their misbehavior and there's only a handful that you could come up with that one reveal that they were always looking for that many of us just didn't have the thing that's essential here is that cdu staff participated in these so-called therapeutic techniques alongside the kids that's the other sort of difference um, with cdu and, the, and some of these other programs that it was an expectation 
of adults to do this as well. Everyone was doing the CDU education simultaneously. So when we'd go through these, you know, what they call profits, these, you know, grueling large group awareness training sessions, um, or these multi-day workshops, or what they called wraps, which was um, attack therapy, or really, it was a lot more than just attack therapy, but that was kind of the, the bones of it. You know, adults were doing this as well. So they were making disclosures all the time. They all came to CDU for a specific reason. I mean, it was a self-help program for them too. And a lot of them were recovering addicts. It really, I mean, CDU was a rehab. And, it, and, it, and even though it was presented in the 90s and 2000s as this kind of um, all-purpose private residential program, it always remained a utopian rehab. When you would talk to the other residents, I mean, were you kind of all on the same page in terms of like, this place is super fucked up, we need to get out of here? I mean, like, what, what were those conversations like? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the statistics on the, I mean, some, the ones that we have on the runaways uh, is astounding. Kids were always trying to leave. Always. Some succeeded. Um, many didn't. Few were missing still. It was uh, a very common daily experience to bolt. There's a reason for it. You know. Did you ever try to, to escape? I didn't try to escape that way. I, what I tried to do after that 5150 was whenever I had an opportunity to get my parents alone, try to speak with them. It was very hard to get them alone. Did they, did they come to visit you or how did that work? Yeah, I think the first, I think they visited maybe six weeks on for a, a, a little day trip on campus. It was, you know, as you progress in the program, you're um, allowed more freedoms. They're not really freedoms but that's how it was it was described um so you can have eventually you can have like an off-campus visit so that's like i don't know four hours in their hotel or something and then eventually when you're maybe 13 or 14 months in you can fly back to your home and do two-day trips three-day trips and that was when i was really able to kind of speak with my parents it took about a year to uh and, and those those r return visits to get the message across up to that point what what had you attempted i mean did you send them letters or like how did you try to communicate stuff to them letters were read so you know and, and mail that we received was read so that was impossible it was really just the phone calls that were unsuccessful and then whatever visit we could get like what what would happen if you did write a letter that you know where you were bad mouthing so you know, like what would happen it would never get out it would be shredded would they would they tell you that or you just would assume that because your parents would never respond or i think it was just kind of well known i mean you were also weren't allowed to talk with anyone in the outside world that wasn't approved um especially not friends so what i remember about like i don't know a year in i flew to o'hare on my own uh and i remember these visits because my my parents had received a, a long list of what was allowed and what wasn't and they thought it was ridiculous and they let me break all the rules when i was back so i think i even went on a date on one of them uh but i you know i saw friends i went to a club and my parents didn't care and they didn't inform the program. Yeah, I would say there's a, there's a, there's a lot in between, like sort of showing up and, and that happening. Like, what else were you were you experiencing? Like, what was it? What was a typical day like for you in that in those first like 14 months? For me, it was you know the day was basically how not to have food allergies. I very clearly recall having to go to the ER for uh, anaphylaxis. It was just how how do you navigate this world? And kids are really skilled at navigating trauma and also kind of. Um, scoffing at it in a way did you did you make friends i sure did absolutely there were a lot of great kids there it was hard to maintain friendships because there was an expectation that you would be pitted against one another uh, at some point was there anyone in particular who stood out like like a friendship that was especially important to you or like one where you were pitted against one another i mean the friendships that i remember were were mostly with um with either kids from my area or people that were part of a punk rock community we weren't allowed to play punk rock sing it i mean that was a, a real punishable offense why what would happen you name it I and mean, the punishments were whatever they wanted it was just hard outdoor labor combined with endless confessions in writing and then the group would really ridicule you in attack therapy and it was all very theatrical too everything there was very ritualistic and that was an element the rituals are were a huge part of of cdu overall and even in early brochures they highlight the ritualistic element when we say rituals like what does that what does that mean like are we talking about chanting or are we talking about yeah like short of levitation it's any other any ritual you can imagine was done you know um 
yeah, it's funny you mentioned chanting because there's a I uncovered in the in the archival footage like a lot of kids reveal there's footage there's video of this you know kids revealing some sort of truth and then the group responds with hissing and I I, I don't I don't remember this at all but it was very jarring to see you know just like you're in a circle you make a confession and then there's just hissing but like like I'm sorry I'm trying to imagine this you're like you're in a room and and you're told to like look each other in the eyes or like how, i don't know oh you know you're in a group you're just you're mingling with each other just with the eyes trying to communicate without words it was just repetition of things with the expectation of a reveal at the end a reveal i don't understand a disclosure something you haven't told anyone before and is this like with a group of people i'm just trying to like so you're 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 in a room. Are you sitting in a circle? Like, what what does it look like? I mean, the the rap sessions that happened three times a week for about four hours. That was it. Was in different rooms, maybe twelve to fourteen kids. We, again, we have to like be clear. Like, the resident population was not substantial, and it was ever changing because people were getting pulled quite a bit. The person you you know you might be close with one day could be totally gone tomorrow. But for the most part, it would, you'd be in a room for four hours. Every single person would have to go around. It was it was confrontation. So, you know, it would be just bullying rage by the adult and then all the kids, which would result in um, shrieking. It was, it was primal scream at that point. So you scream at each other, then you are moved to scream at the floor. And then there's, you know, sometimes you might scream so much you'll get a bloody nose. You're certainly gonna burst blood vessels. And then it's sobbing just and dry heaving. And, and that was the sounds of Sidhu. So it was a weird combination of attack therapy, primal scream, whatever 60s or 70s self-help human potential movement crap that could be pieced together was done. And that was just like the daily basis. But then you have the profits, which were 24 hours and you're basically doing even more, you know, psychodrama uh, and savagery. I mean, it was just total savagery. Uh, and then those would extend to workshops. So I think one was three days, one was about seven days. If Sidhu claimed to have some sort of education or curriculum, that was it. It was the raps, the profits, and the workshops. And profits and workshops were spread out over the course of the two-year term. So I didn't endure all of them, but I did quite a bit. And that was it. That was the point of the program. You mentioned attack therapy. What is what is that? Attack therapy originated really from um, Synodon, which C2 is part of too. I mean, it, it's just endless screaming and indictments, as personal as you can get, as far-fetched as you can get. It's rage that can result in epiphany. That was the thinking. I would assume you felt like complete shit after these these kinds of sessions. Oh, totally. You never you never found it cathartic. You're not supposed to. I mean, that's the whole break them down part. I mean, you you're day to day decimated. You sustain that feeling for a long time. But if you know that your disclosure is bullshit, and if you I mean I, I mean I've talked to a lot of ex residents about this, where they would make packs with their friends. This is what we're going to confess to today. We're going to like pretend to fight in raps. And they script it, rehearse it even, and then it's, it doesn't sting as much. Im, you know, there's no improvisation and therefore there's no feeling attached to it. You could laugh it off later. So there wasn't, you know, it depends on, you know, on the moment, on the counselor. But largely, I don't remember raps because they all blur together. They weren't really serious. At first, it was very forceful and very traumatizing. But then once I figured out the architecture of them, I could understand what i should be feeling afterwards i don't know if this makes any sense no 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 absolutely i mean it sounds like i mean it's a coping mechanism right did you have a sense when you were when you were in all of this like how extraordinarily fucked up it all was yeah daily <laughs> totally i'll tell you this so when i returned uh, to public high school i remember the high school had was called the drop-in center and it they had you know after school or even during school you know like um group therapy essentially. And I went once and it was just a bunch of people sitting around. There was one counselor or whatever he was, and the kids were just chatting. And I had a panic attack and I bolted from the room. I couldn't deal with it. My only experience with group therapy was at CDU. That was my first, my introduction to it. So I didn't know that you weren't supposed to shriek and scream and sob and be indicted and be ridiculed for everything. It didn't make any sense to me that this was actual talking and listening and human communication. I'm amazed that you 
said yes to going. How are you doing talking about all this, by the way? A lot of a lot of shit to get into. It's way more personal than I ex expected. I thought we were going to be talking about, like, you know, the fact-finding mission and investigations and, you know, how was it for you? <laughs> you know? I mean, obviously, it's it's uh, it's tough to hear about, but, you know, it's also like my... my um... I kind of my, my dad was a was a trauma specialist, so I kind of grew up hearing a lot of these sorts of stories. You know, your father is such a pivotal figure in you know survivors of childhood trauma and such a, a, a name brand. I can't count how many people have just like thrust it on me. You know, body keeps the score. I mean, it's just like it's a, it's a, almost a cliche, the, the line. You know, and I I um, at the same time though, you know, there are a lot of kids at CDU who were the sons and daughters of psychiatrists or psychologists or neurologists and it was a trap for the mental health professionals too i mean so many people who go into mental health are so fucked up themselves you know i mean you had to have had some awareness in your upbringing about this industry right i mean probably not more than the average person i think um i knew that these sorts of places existed and that a lot of them were abusive and you know i don't delve like super deep into like i've never even read my dad's book I didn't, I didn't finish The Body Keeps the Score. I read like a few pages and I said, dude, I lived this. Right. <laughs> I mean, I feel slightly sheepish even, even drawing any kind of parallels because your experience was clearly so overboard of, you know, inappropriateness and, and abuse and everything. But I, I did, I did experience, I did do like a month long, like, uh, I went to like a massage school training program that had a lot of, like, I, it had the feeling that ha had I been there for a longer period, it would have, like, a lot of these sort of culty sort of influences, I think, would have would really come in. There was a real emphasis on not necessarily breaking people down, but people ha having these confessions. It's, it's interesting that that's something that I think is indicative of, of cults is, like, if, if people are making themselves vulnerable, somehow that gets them more involved and i remember these um they would do these sessions um called it was like active listening or conscious listening i can't quite remember where literally um uh you would you would partner up with someone you would hold their hand you would hold eye contact with them the whole time and they would talk for five minutes i think we did i think you did things like that too i'm sure the whole reason i signed up for the program was to you know i just like i wanted to learn a practical skill Maybe I, you know, maybe I could become like a body worker or physical therapist or whatever. And half the program was these sorts of like, they would call it life learning skills. And everyone who participated in these or like 90% of people who participate in these things, they would be in tears by the end of it. And they would be talking about like how their father never loved them and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I just want to learn like, I just want to learn anatomy guys. <laughs> like, you know, and of course, everyone, everyone interpreted that as, as like, oh, that's Nick. He's like not in touch with his feelings. So then I became sort of ostracized um, because I like didn't feel a need to just like break down and start crying. <laughs> you know, that's really fascinating. Yeah, That would have been me. That whole strategy I find actually really fascinating that you, you would get together with your friends and actually come up with these, these fictional confessions to make. Cause that's, I could totally see myself doing the same thing in, in that situation, you know? What I think about a lot is the, is I, we were just pointing this out, is the kind of group euphoria. That's a problem. Like, I, I remember a lot of this, you know, after a profit, everyone was in tears. They had these great moments. They wanted to share those moments, but obviously you weren't allowed to talk about them. And then when we retrieved the archive, there was all this footage of the CD graduations and all the kids are in white. And there's, and these are very long graduation ceremonies. This is unlike a normal high school graduation. Those were very ritualistic. And at the end, the kids, the graduating kids are supposed to give these speeches and it is the longest weeping and slobbering. It, they're, they're a little hard to describe, but th it was another form of forced confession, but it's in front of a group just praising this as if it's, um, they found Jesus. It, it was, it was very, very religious. These graduations and the kind of the, the euphoria and the theatrical sobbing that went along with it. I mean, I, I've like, it was like 80 videos, or 80 plus videos. So it's just year after year after year after year of the same thing. So take me back to like when, when you, when you were allowed to go visit your parents for the first time, you could actually have an unmonitored conversation with them. What was that like? Uh, it was invigorating. I mean, I was back home too. So it was, I think the fact that I could like, um, 
go go to the bathroom on my own <laughs> you know or i was i was sleeping without three boys next to me and a, you know they would do dorm checks every hour the night staff so they were always wa- wandering and winding through the dorms with flashlights on you so you learn to sleep with someone always around and shining a light on you so it was it was kind of one of the strangest experience i don't remember sleeping when i finally returned because i was just expecting someone to walk in but when i was at cdo i would just i would sleep within seconds you know you just kind of pass out uh just from pure physical and emotional exhaustion but i don't know what, what was your question was about returning with those that first home visit yeah no, like like what did you tell your parents when you you finally got the chance to to have an unmonitored conversation with them i don't remember the specifics of the conversations but i do remember that they they seem to trust me more and they they seem to be displeased i mean my mom now will claim that she always felt cd was creepy that's her words i think my dad made friends and i think he benefited in his own way from the other side of the cd program which was meant for parents that's a whole other discussion but i think the fact that we could just talk you know talk about what we're gonna get for dinner that kind of normal family relationship helped strengthen their realization of oh maybe he doesn't even be two thousand miles away did i mean did you tell them like please i want to come home all the time every single time i ever spoke with them for 16 months was that conversation but it didn't get me anywhere you know that was the problem is that the things i would try to out to them seemed so far-fetched and then the counter narrative would occur right so like I would say something that happened. It would discontinue the phone call. The hand would go down, just hung up. You're out of the, you know, the building, this little uh, trailer building where they had you know, the phone calls were monitored. And then immediately they would get a call back saying everything that I said was inaccurate. And this is just proves that I'm a liar. So my parents started to get the sense that the things that I said about day-to-day life at CU weren't real. So it was a losing strategy to admit anything that happened. Like what were you trying to tell them? What kinds of stuff? If the point of sending me to CDU was to treat depression, there was no depression treatment. So really what I was trying to do was get that point across. I didn't. It would take actually two decades and um, depositions, private depositions that were sent to me by another CDU family where um, in sworn testimony, you know, CDU officials revealed that they never they never had depression treatment and they would actually actively turn away according to these depositions kids that were sent for depression they just didn't know how to handle it and that fact was actually confirmed by uh, one of the later program directors to me that they just didn't know what to do with depressed kids so you made you made attempts to sort of explain how how horrible it was to your parents and then did you repeat all that stuff when you met with them in person or like what did you what did you say to them? Yeah, but I mean, the other the other side of this is that I was actually having physical problems being at CDU that my parents were aware of, and that was it was irrefutable. So like, you know, I, I was having heart rhythm problems, and I had to wear a Holter monitor, which is the only time that I'd ever had heart problems, and a lot of that had to do with you know we we had to do these boot camp workouts, and I'm an asthmatic. My mom remembers flying out just to you know go to see some cardiac doctor. I don't have a vivid memory of this, but she does. In addition to that, I think I mentioned before, but I was having a lot of food allergies, and you know I. I when you're sending me to the Mountain Community ER for EpiPen treatment because their part-time nurse isn't around and no one has an EpiPen, uh, I mean, this is problematic because my question to them is always, if you knew there were so many physical issues, why were you keeping me there for so long? It wasn't like they were going to turn around and, and correct themselves. It was clearly the, the atmosphere, the environment, the, uh, the program itself. So it was finally when I was healthy, they could see me back home and healthy and eating better foods and having a social life and returning to the social life, even if it was just for three days, that helped. And how, how was it to leave them? Like how, like what note did you leave things with, with your parents when you went back? Uh, well, I remember two home visits and the first one, it was unclear whether they were going to give me an early release, but I could sense that maybe it was around the corner. The second time it was clear. I think they even admitted. They t- they told me, but they stuck to a schedule that was really unhelpful. The way that you should pull a kid from the program is sort of the same way he or she entered it, which is you know immediately. And they st- stuck to a schedule where they notified the program like months in advance. They notified me, so it became really clear to the program I might be leaving. Which for them, you know, it, this is a this is a business. You know, they need me there for two years. They're going to do whatever they can 
at their end, Sidhu's end, to ensure that it would appear to my parents that I was falling back to bad behavior to convince my parents to stay for the full two-year term. So that was a, that was a problem, you know, that was that, that two-month window, roughly, where I knew I was returning, and yet I was still there. So take me through that, that like, those, those last, like, how, how did you actually leave? I don't remember leaving campus. This would, be, would have been May of 2000. But I remember being in the rental car with my dad. I remember what was playing on the radio. I remember the flight back home. So I remember all that, but I don't remember the hours leading up to it. And it's not because I think anything um, seriously traumatic happened. I think it's because nothing happened. I think at that point, I had been so erased from the community, from the Sidhu family. I, I had been essentially shunned at that point, and so had my parents at their end. So it really was just, you know, packing whatever things I have and saying goodbye to, to the few friends that were there, you know, and then leaving camp. Were you hugely relieved? Oh, I mean, it, it was the only relief. It was the biggest relief. To date, it was the most profound moment in that entire 16 months was just getting back in a rental car with my dad and going down the mountain for the last time. And I haven't, I haven't returned. When we were working on the Lost Kids podcast, they asked me if I wanted to go back and I declined. I, I don't have any desire to return to that mountain. I also don't think it would break me if I went back. I don't think it would be as emotionally destructive or it certainly wouldn't be cathartic whatever that word even means i think it would just be sort of neutral did you intend to keep in touch with any of the friends that you made there or no i mean well maybe some of the local guys i think what had happened was there was a decision made to just never talk about it when i returned it just it did not happen a decision made by who i think it was a collective decision with my my parents they would say that they wanted to honor my decision to not speak about it but i think there was just a, a deep family embarrassment about the entire mistake you know they, they considered it a mistake too so it was better for me to not talk about it and i i really felt if the program didn't consider me authentic if they did if they had discounted the last 16 months if i had been shunned then why do I need to give it any credibility in my other life? If I if they don't think it happened, then I'm not going to either. And that was a, a coping strategy just to return to public high school because um, I went right back into it. There was no break, really. There was a summer break, but my parents very smartly kept me busy the entire time. I got a job immediately. I did a program at Northwestern University for, for high school kids, and that I was actually back living in a dorm. But it was, an, you know, it was, a, it was a real one this time. Um, and then I went right back into to high school as a junior. So there was just no time to reflect and also no time to get deprogrammed. Uh, there was certainly no therapy. What happened was when, the minute I returned, I got off the medication. Or I started to, rather. One took a lot longer to taper off of than I expected. But I immediately got off Zoloft. And I have not touched an antidepressant since. And that was... That was at your insistence? Yeah, that was it. My parents no longer had uh, the luxury of any sort of parenting at that point, it, and they weren't going to make decisions on my behalf about my body. I wanted to maintain a relationship with them. I was still living under their roof. I mean, I, I am close with my parents still. It, it would take too much to hate them. And I think that was also part of what CD wanted. And I didn't want to give Sidhu that satisfaction of estrangement. Sorry, you think that they wanted you to hate your parents? They absolutely did. I mean, that was part of the activities, you know, when you when you have to pound a pillow and imagine your father's face. I mean, there was there was a and my parents would agree with this too that they there was a very clear message sent to my parents that I was sort of being brought up anew by better, tougher adults, and that was a permanent sort of thing. So when I returned, it wasn't like now we're a tight family it was just more we're going to remain in each other's lives but if it comes to these sorts of decisions they're mine and mine alone did you did you resent them at all for having sent you there i understand getting duped i understand getting duped by an entire community as well what i don't understand or respect was this lack of an investigative mind so the entire history of sidhu and all of its nefariousness and wrongdoing and cultic background is documented it's you know you my parents could have dug up the same old newspapers that i did 20 years later um while i was there i mean they could if they didn't believe me when i made claims they could have done research to 
for any reason. I mean, they, they, they just never looked into this. They just trusted a couple of people, a couple of strangers, and that was it. So that's, that's the side that I don't understand. And that extends to many, many, many senior parents. And I imagine many TTI parents. They're just, you know, when you think you're doing something that's, you know, some desperate move, the last stop kind of measure, it doesn't necessarily mean you should stop looking things up. So they didn't do that. I did that 15 years after leaving it. It was up to me to do all the grueling research, to distill the history, to get all the public records, to ask all the questions. And then I took that to my parents. 15, it took 15 years in my, and, and it, I, so I resent that I had to do this bullshit work just to have a conversation with my parents. There wasn't someone else that could act as the conduit to reality for CDU. Well, listen, let's, I think, I feel like that's um, an okay place to, to leave things for, for now. And then we can dive into the, you know, the aftermath and the archive and all the research and stuff. Thanks. Thanks for being up for it. And um, yeah, thanks for going, going down that rabbit hole with me. We'll, we'll do another rabbit hole. I'm game.